welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to all of you who have gathered in the sanctuary, all of you who are joining us online, welcome to you as well. As we give praise to God and worship together, I pray that we will all be blessed together. Let us now worship God together. Begin with our call to worship. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises, for God is king over all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Please pray with me. God and Father of all, you have willed that the last shall be first, and you have made a little child the measure of your kingdom. Give us wisdom, which is from above, so we may understand that in your sight, the one who serves is the greatest of all. While we live among transient things, grant that we may hold fast to those things that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Stand for our first hymn.
please be seated. Several announcements in the bulletin that you may be interested in. We are starting a new prayer group, not a formal thing, but an informal prayer group. Started last Monday and will continue, we hope, into the future. It will be in our prayer room, the small room just off the sanctuary, and it will be just a gathering of people who would like to get together and pray about whatever things are on your heart. Each other, the world, our community, sick people, um, the church, there will be many opportunities to pray. So join us 1130 on Mondays if you are interested in that kind of prayer group. Tuesday, of course, we have Bible study at 11, which meets in the parlor in uh, Stratton Chapel. Be happy to have anyone who is interested in learning what the scriptures are going to be for the next Sunday and something about what they say to us. There are other announcements, uh, especially you might be interested, some of you have expressed interest in helping with food boxes, and we uh, will pack uh, a week from tomorrow on Monday. Boxes will be packed for that week or the next. I believe they're given out that week or the next week. So if you are interested in that, just please call and uh, we'll get your name on the list to help with the packing. Yesterday, we had a wonderful meeting of women from throughout South Mississippi, the, uh, Mississippi, the Presbytery of Mississippi, who met here for the annual fall gathering. From that gathering, we uh, gained a very large donation for our uh, food box ministry. They always tradition, they traditionally take up an offering and give it to one of the ministries of uh, the church that is hosting the event, and they chose the food box ministry for their donation. More on that after we receive the check from them, but it was a wonderful, wonderful donation, yes. So read your announcements and take part as you are able during this week and all the coming weeks and months. We turn now to a time of confession. Let's join together in the call to confession. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and neighbor together. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. is in a position to con condemn us, only Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came into this world to live and to die for us, to be raised for us, 
to reign in power for us and to pray for us. In him, we are a new creation. The old creation has gone and a new creation begins. Know that in him, your sins are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Let us stand to give glory to God. those forgiven through Jesus Christ, let us not forget to forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you today. And also with you. Now greet one another from your pew. Psalms. 
you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that waits at noonday. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. A reading from 1 Timothy. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who, in the present age, are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Please stand for our second hymn.
please be seated. We continue with our reading in the Gospel, a reading from Luke. There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that, that he may warn them, so that they will not come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The word of the Lord for us today. Thanks be to God. You note many similar themes today from those we've had in the past few weeks. It's this entire chapter, really, this little section of Luke that we find many of the same themes and I look out and see all of you. I'm, I know most of you pretty well. And I know that there is no one in here who is this rich man. I know there is no one in here who is this Lazarus. Now, we may be filled with membership who are well-to-do people. Who's to know? We may have people who suffer. Who's to know? But we know if someone in our congregation became Lazarus by the gate, that wouldn't last for long because we would rise up and help. We would take him away, feed him and clothe him and care for him. This story of Lazarus and the rich man is one of the hardest, I think that Luke tells. The contrasts are really stark and dark, ugly. We don't want any part of it. We don't want to be the rich man who is ignoring the person dying by his gate, and we certainly don't want to be Lazarus. We find nothing to admire about the rich man. And yet, he doesn't say anything or do anything against Lazarus. The problem is, he doesn't even seem to know he exists. So perhaps the most important lesson for us today is just a reminder to keep our eyes open and our e ears open and our heart open so we don't fail to see someone lying at the gate. I'm very thankful to have Paul's words to read alongside this 
story of the rich man and Lazarus. Paul calls all of us to task. And I think this is a beautiful place for us to be able to enter this story and to find some perspective for the way that God may want us to see this story as part of our life. The rich man at his sumptuous table eats so well. Lazarus only dreams of crumbs that might fall. In his letter to young Timothy, Paul warns against seeking fulfillment in material wealth. He offers a little proverb, a very famous proverb, we brought nothing into the world and we will take nothing out with us. The rich man in today's parable seems fulfilled by his wealth. No worries, no questions about tomorrow, no thoughts about who else is around who might need his help, anyone he might share his wealth with. But here, how Paul frames his warnings to young Timothy, reminding him contentment comes when we have a true understanding of who we're called to be. Choose the right way to seek contentment in this life, Paul says. It's doubtful that will come unless you combine it with what you have learned about your Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. Without godliness, what is left? Only selfish indulgence, the kind of contentment seen quite clearly in the palatial home of the rich man in the story today. The rich man's beautiful surroundings, his table that's laden with bountiful food, his clothes made of purple cloth, all of these seem to have made him quite happy. There is nothing innately wrong with that, but something is missing. His happiness, his contentment, reveals no godliness, that is, no deference to those God has from the beginning of time instructed the well-to-do of the world to remember, to watch out for. When money and material riches become the center of the man's life, he falls into the temptation of becoming complacent to all around him who might have needs. Paul says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. We certainly know many 21st century stories similar to this one, stories about extravagant lifestyles and insatiable appetites for luxury, the newest and the best, and set in the midst of a time of much greed in this culture in which we live, the Christian and the church are called by Christ to defend against it. The temptation is ours as well to be tempted also to let our priorities slip and to become a part of that greed and that self-centeredness that we know Paul is warning Timothy to avoid. More emphasis on material wealth sometimes makes us feel more secure when indeed it is eroding our trust and our faith in God. So let's hear these words again. It's important today as it has been several times in recent weeks to say this, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The message is not that money is evil. It is not. The message is not that wealth is, e is evil. It is not. The love of money is what is dangerous. It can lead to that greed and selfishness, and it can stifle compassion for the poor. Truly, these warnings are not just for the very well-to-do. They're for the comfortable in life. Jesus is known to be a teacher who wants to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, as the old saying goes. Truly, 
those warnings can be for any one of us. I like this little statement that came from somewhere, not sure where. Stewardship is not just what you plan to do when you become wealthy and have lots to share. It's what you plan to do with the $15 in your pocket today, right? John Calvin, not one you'd expect to be such a proponent of these things that I'm about to tell you, he said, but he was. He is often misunderstood and remembered for only one or two things that really are becoming obsolete in many lives today. But he praised the God who richly blessed creation and people. His favorite psalm is said to have been Psalm 104, where we read of God's many blessings for all the creation, the creatures, as well as for us. And then he goes on to say, remember moderation in all you do, in the blessings you have received, and in the way that you handle these before God. He says, for instance, did not God endow gold and silver, ivory and marble with a loveliness that renders them more precious than other metals and stones? Did he not, in short, render many things attractive to us apart from their necessary use? He cautions about these beautiful things. We are not to use God's blessings indulgently or to seek wealth greedily, but to serve dutifully in our calling. We must resist the lust of the flesh. What is, he asks, what is our gratefulness toward God for our clothing if in the sumptuousness of our dress we look down upon those and despise theirs who can't dress as we do. His comments, I think, speak directly to the difference between contentment that is godly and contentment which is not. We can admire very beautiful objects, but we can't worship them, Calvin says, and I think Jesus says very clearly. We can find contentment in a life of plenty, but not contentment that causes a chasm to form between us and those who are not so blessed as we are. Since the beginning of the history between God and humankind, God has shown through his holy word the difference between content contentment that is from God and contentment that is not from God. Wealth is a spiritual issue. The Bible does not shun. Many stories are told to illuminate the traps and temptations of poor stewardship of wealth. There's the betrayal of Judas for a bag of coin, uh, the, by Judas of Jesus for a bag of coins. There are a couple of times that missionaries like Paul and Silas are put in jail because they're disrupting business practices in some of the cities where they were working. When we look at the significance of what Jeremiah does in our Old Testament lesson today, I think we find a fascinating example of how God says contentment and godliness can come through wealth. Jeremiah was not a wealthy person, but Jeremiah could purchase a piece of land as war was going on all about his city because God instructed him to do that as a sampling of what God would do in the future. This land, this small piece of land, was paradigmatic for the larger Israel that would be restored one day after the people who were going into exile returned. Money, wealth, property, all have been used by God in Scripture to teach us amazing lessons. Con contentment as used by Paul in the words that we read today in the letter to Timothy, contentment means the same thing as sufficiency. And one of 
Paul's most famous quotations comes not from 1 Timothy, but from Corinthians when he speaks of a thorn in his side and he prays for God, for Christ to remove it, and he receives this answer, my grace is sufficient for you. It was from that moment he had a better understanding of what contentment that is combined with godliness can mean in a person's life. The rich man who ignored Lazarus, who did not even notice him lying at his gate, practiced a particular kind of coveting in his life, the opposite of gratitude. It's the kind of coveting that disallows generosity to break through and to overcome that desire for plenty, that desire to covet wealth. Coveting is shown in Scripture to be where the breaking of other commandments might always begin. It happened to the man in the parable Jesus told about a barn overflowing with grain. And he tore down the old barns to build newer and bigger ones so that all the grain could be put in the big barn. And that was because he couldn't bear to let any of it go. And he didn't understand what it meant to be rich toward God. Now, being satisfied, accepting what is sufficient, is not complacency. That state of mind doesn't mean we're satisfied with the status quo, though. Being satisfied, being contented, being rich toward God, those are the things that we are to strive for. for. Be rich in good works, Paul says. Be generous, ready to share. At the last, when we read of him at the end, Lazarus inherits finally a place of his own, the comfort he has long sought. The rich man loses what he has, but even in his torment, he calls to Abraham to send Lazarus to him with a cup of water, as if Lazarus is his servant. Lazarus, the one he never noticed, lying in pain and dying by his gate. What will it take to give the rich man that godliness that Paul describes? Eyes to see as Jesus Christ sees, ears to hear the cries that Christ hears, hearts to share with others the bountiful grace which, of which we are God's stewards. I'd like to offer at the end of these words this prayer from St. Benedict. Listen to these words as you listen reverently. O gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. To our great God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory today. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, help us in our day as people who strive to be like Christ and follow his way to have eyes that are open and ears that are always alert to the sounds of cries. Give us hearts that could not bear to turn away from someone in pain. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand now and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us turn to God in prayer as we remember the whole world is in God's hands and he calls us to pray for every person in that world. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, direct us and help us in all we do so that in our works, always begun in you, we may continue in your will and make it all the way to the end, fulfilling what you call us to do. Help us to glorify your holy name so that at the last we might obtain everlasting life. May your church, O oh God, always honor your presence by welcoming all your people especially those who are needy or suffering. Give us eyes to see, hearts to discern, that we are brothers and sisters of one another, and gather us to love and serve you in Christ. We do pray for your world, that your spirit may hover above and throughout all the places, especially those places where there is deep sorrow and despair, where there is hunger, where there is war, injustice, and hopelessness. We pray for your people everywhere, including your people in our community. We pray for the children everywhere who are growing, and we pray that there will be a way for them to learn your good word so that another generation might grow up into the faith of Jesus Christ. Give us this day and all the days of our lives courage to pray and the courage and the will to proclaim your word in what we say and in what we do, and even in the thoughts that we have. Let us turn our lives over to the compassionate Christ who may send us where we need to be to serve you. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is time to bring our tithes and our gifts and our offerings and let us do so in joy. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you to all who are online with us today. Thank you for giving and taking part in this part of the service with us.
let us pray. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to bring gifts for the work of your kingdom in this place. Lead us to use these gifts in a way that is in accordance with your will for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now with many thanks to those who helped today as ushers and greeters and our acolyte and the choir, a beautiful choir which is growing. We have uh, three new uh, choir members we'll introduce to you um, at some point soon. Vincent will do that. Um, I thank you for coming today and, and joining in worship. It, it's been a beautiful time together. Let us now end the service and go out on a beautiful and uh, God-praising hymn as we sing our last hymn together. <laughs> out and serve the Lord and serve with gladness. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and always. Amen. Amen.